Um, so welcome to the first colloquium of this uh, semester. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Kota Morase from Penn State University um, visiting us virtually. Um, so Kota got his PhD from Kyoto University in Japan in 2010, where he was a JSPS doctoral fellow. And then he was a JSPS postdoctoral fellow at Ohio State University uh, till 2012. And then he was a Hubble fellow at uh, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton uh, till 2014. Um, before he moved on, moved to Penn State as an assistant professor, uh, and now he's an associate professor uh, in the Department of Physics and also in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at Penn State. Uh, he has got several uh, prizes, including a Sloan Research Fellowship in 2017 and an Ikawa Memorial Prize in 2019. Uh, his research interests are in uh, mostly particle astrophysics, and he has done some very important work there. Uh, he is a leading expert on the possible astrophysical sources for ultra high energy neutrinos. And uh, today he'll tell us about uh, high energy neutrino astrophysics in the multi messenger era. So, Kota, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you very much for the invitations. And uh, uh, it's my great pleasure to be at the Corkium here and also it's Badger. So today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the recent uh, news about the high-energy neutrinos. And I would like to discuss the uh, uh, origin of the neutrinos, the possible implications in light of the multi-messenger uh, astrophysics. Okay, today, the, so I'm going to begin with the introduction. I will uh, focus, mostly discuss uh, astrophysical implication. If time is allowed, I'm going to talk about the new physics implications like a dark matter, but if only if time is wrong. Okay, so the first, uh, the, let's begin with uh, neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos uh, are one of the elementary particles uh, which belong to lepton. And then neutrinos are electrically neutral. And then they only uh, interact with matter or radiations of weak interactions. So the, sometimes uh, they are called the ghost particles. For example, the, uh, uh, always uh, the, we have a neutrino from the sun, the sun emits neutrinos, and then uh, the hundred trillion of neutrinos uh, go through, uh, the hundred neutrinos uh, per second go through the, you know, the human, but we, we never notice, right? So the, in order to detect the neutrinos, uh, basically you usually need to detect a large volume or detector with large volume because of the, these tiny, tiny uh, uh, the interaction strengths. Now also, the, we know that uh, neutrinos have a um, uh, mass, although the, they are very tiny. So that essentially massless, but it's not uh, zero. Now we know that uh, neutrinos have three types of three flavors. So that we have uh, uh, the electron types of neutrinos, and the muon types of neutrinos, and tau, uh, nu and tau neutrinos. And then neutrinos are important in light of the astrophysics, and then the, we can use the neutrinos to probe the astrophysical environment. And then the, actually the, this is the uh, reason for the Nobel Prize in 2002. And then uh, Lemon Davis Jr. and then uh, detected, the, you know, the, his group uh, detected the neutrinos from the sun using the homostatic experiment. And then also the, in the, the famous event is uh, happened in 1987. And then the Kamio Kande, led by the Koshiba, uh, detected the neutrinos from a supernova 1987A. And then the, these are enable us to study the very uh, interiors of the stars, which cannot be seen by photons directly. So that we can learn about uh, uh, the, what happens, the, what is the energy source of the, in the interior interior, well, we can learn about the, how the, uh, the uh, what happens around the core crops of the massive stars. So in this sense, uh, neutrinos can prove that uh, they can, can be used to study the astrophysics. Also, using the neutrinos from the astrophysical sources, we can also study the particle physics itself. So now this is actually related to the Nobel Prize in the 2015. And then the, the super Kamiokande experiments actually just uh, look for the neutrinos which are produced in the atmosphere. And then they look for the uh, flavors and they found that the uh, neutrinos flavor change during the propagation. So that actually the, this is so-called the neutrino oscillation, which is also seen by the, the different experiments that actually one of the 
So this is a snow experiment. And then basically the, uh, the existence of neutrino oscillations means that uh, uh, neutrinos mass uh, has to be finite. And then this actually the important, uh, this is the, also the hint of the physics beyond the standard model. So the when the, uh, the Kajita sons actually won the Nobel Prize, and he, uh, this is a, uh, what he said. He says that uh, I want to suck the neutrinos, but uh, since neutrinos are created by cosmic rays, I want to suck them. So the super Kamikaze experiments, the neutrinos are produced in an atmosphere, and actually the uh, neutrinos are originally produced by cosmic rays. And what is a cosmic rays? The cosmic rays are uh, uh, energetic charged particles coming from space. So the, uh, the we, you know, always the cosmic rays actually uh, come from the space and which cause uh, soft errors in electric device. And also that if you go to space, uh, this is uh, actually a problem for the, this is a source of the radiation exposure. And then these cosmic rays are historically very important because uh, uh, they can be regarded as a cosmic gifts. And uh, we, the study of the cosmic rays uh, uh, had, had a play, played a crucial role in the particle physics and astronomy. And indeed, for example, the, uh, the pion uh, is actually discovered in the, uh, using the, uh, uh, the, uh, the looking for the signatures uh, caused by the cosmic rays. So, uh, however, and uh, we since then the, we we can measure the cosmic rays, and the cosmic rays have been measured over the wide energy range. So this is the spectrum of cosmic rays. So we know that uh, cosmic rays uh, uh, the shows the spectrum of a paro, and you see that the cosmic rays have been measured from the wide energy range and from the GeV to the 10 to the 20 electron volt. And roughly speaking, the cosmic ray spectrum can be described a paro. And then, 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 then if you look at this, uh, the spectrum very carefully, and one may notice the structure, so the, for example, the run the PEB, so the PEB is a 10 to 15 electron volt, then you have a steep link, which is called Ni. And they are run that a uh, few times 10 to the 18 electron volt. The EEV is corresponds to the 10 to the 18 electron volt. Then we have a spectral hardening, which is so-called angle. And then uh, central problem, one of the central problem is that the, uh, what is the origin of the cosmic rays? What is the acceleration mechanism? And what, you know, the, what is the propagation and the propagation process? So the, in particular, the origin of the ultra high energy cosmic rays. The highest energy cosmic rays is actually the, uh, of particular interest for some people because uh, the energy of ultra high energy cosmic rays is reaches a few times uh, uh, 19 electron volt or even 10 to 20 electron volt. So the, this is a corresponds to about a 50 joule and uh, which is the order of the kinetic energy of a tennis ball with 160 kilometer power. So just one um, tiny microscopic particle has uh, you know, uh, the energy of the tennis ball, the microscopic body. So the, the, that's it actually the uh, very energetic particle. And then of course, such an energy, energetic particle cannot be produced um, on Earth. So the, uh, the, the, quite, the accelerators that we have, the largest accelerator we have is the large hadron collider. And then, then, then the maximum energy we can reach is around the uh, 30 TeV in the center mass frame. Okay, this is uh, total energy. And then, as you see, is that the energy of ultra high cosmic rays that about 10 to 20 electron volts. So you can see that the energy of ultra cosmic rays is uh, many orders magnitude larger than the uh, energy we can achieve on Earth. So if you want to achieve the energy of the cosmic rays uh, using the LHC-like uh, accelerator, basically you need to prepare the uh, LHC with a mercury orbit. Okay, probably this is impossible. So in the sense, actually, the very energetic cosmic rays are very uh, interesting. And then, but in order to understand the, the mechanism of production and propagation, so we really need to know the, what the source is, what is the origin. This is the, uh, the something we wanted to look for. However, and then theoretically, and then the uh, primary, we don't, theoretically, the uh, 
primary candidates, the most promising candidates are believed to be a black hole object. So the, this is a picture of the, uh, the M87, which is a, a, a elliptical galaxy. And then, and then if you look at, the, this is a Hubble image, and this is a galaxy. And then in the center of the, this galaxy, the, this is the famous uh, image of the su supermassive black holes uh, taken by the Event Horizon Telescope. And then we know that uh, uh, the, in the engine, in the center of this galaxy, that there's a supermassive black hole. Um, and then we, then, then we, then you also see the uh, kind of the structure, which is so-called jet. And then this jet is uh, very large, and you see that the you know the length of the jet is about five thousand light years. So the uh, as you can imagine that the, even for the uh, astrophysical sources, it's not so easy to produce ultra high cosmic rays. Only extreme uh, objects such as a black hole or active black holes may be able to produce the highest energy particles. However, the, we don't have a clues observationally, and uh, people wanted to uh, uh, identify the sources. And but uh, in order to detect ultra high cosmic rays, you need a very large detectors. So the event rate of the ultra high cosmic rays is small. Basically, the one event per Q uh, kilometer square per 300 year. Okay, so that in order to get, get the statistics, you need to build the huge detectors. For this purpose, now the, uh, the PL observatory and telescope array were, exist in the uh, world. So in particular, the PL observatory has an area of 3,000 kilometer square. And then we actually were able to measure the cosmic gray spectrum and isotropy in great detail. However, uh, short answer is that uh, uh, even though we detected the cosmic rays and we have statistics, uh, we have not uh, successfully find the sources. The reason is that uh, cosmic rays are mainly charged particles. So the cosmic rays uh, have to propagate the intergalactic space. And then uh, there's a magnetic field in the intergalactic space, uh, but we don't know the magnetic field in the galactic space. And in addition, we have a magnetic field in our Milky Way, in our galaxies. And the ultra high cosmic rays can be diffracted and uh, by the, these magnetic fields, and then they, this uh, prevents us uh, from the identifying the uh, position of the sources very easily. So that it's not so straightforward. So the, in this sense, actually, the, we need to use, it's better to use uh, neutral particles, like uh, photons. Photons are actually are relatively easy to detect. We have uh, uh, many uh, good telescopes, um, including gamma rays. But the question, problem, one of the problems is that the very high energy gamma rays start to interact with the radiation field in the space. For example, CMB, cosmic micro background radiation, and EBA X-ray background, including the infrared optical light. And they interact with the low energy background of photons, then produce the electron positron pairs, and then high energy gamma rays cannot, ultra, very high energy gamma rays cannot reach us as they are. So, in this sense, the neutrinos are uh, unique, uh, which enable us to see the distant universe uh, invisible with gamma rays or ultra high cosmic rays. So the neutrino telescopes, uh, the idea of detecting neutrino was proposed uh, many, many years ago. So the actually 60s. And then the uh, main idea is to uh, put a uh, detector in the deep in the lake sea or ice. And then to determine, then, the, then when the neutrinos interact with uh, uh, matter, a neutron, a proton or neutron, a nucleus, and then they make uh, 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 muons or uh, other uh, charged particles, and then you can, uh, they charge particles emit the uh, chemical radiation. The by uh, detecting the chemical radiation, so we can detect the neutrinos. This is the idea. Then the, the idea was proposed many, many years ago. However, the um, detection was uh, thought, previously people, many people thought that detection was very impossible or very tough, right? Because uh, this is simply because the uh, interaction is so weak, uh, we, you need a huge detector to achieve this goal. However, the, thanks to the uh, uh, developments, and in particular the, uh, the ice cube, 
Ice Cube is actually the, uh, the one kilometer cubic detector, which was built uh, at the Antarctica as a South Pole. And then this was completed in the 2010. And then, then they put a, a strings and then they put the um, hot material tubes and in the one kilometer deep under the uh, surface. And you can see that uh, this is a huge and the detector size is much larger than the effort server. And then uh, the, finally, the, by use, building the, such a gigantic into detectors, and then the, the collaborations uh, the, are reported the discovery of high energy cosmic neutrinos, which happened in the, about 10 years ago, the 2010, 12, 2013. And the paper was published in the PRL or science. So this was uh, one of the, uh, the major breakthroughs in the field of particle astrophysics. And then this is a kind of the image of the projected uh, image of the, uh, uh, the shower that produced by the ice cube uh, events. And you see that uh, energy of neutrinos is, uh, if the neutrino energy is one PeV, and then the image of the shower is around uh, uh, 10 to the, uh, okay, it's a few hundred meters, which is actually the much bigger than the building in the Madison. Okay. Then there are two detection modes. And then, the, as I said, that the neutrinos uh, uh, can be detected via interactions. So the one important interaction is uh, the uh, neutrino, when the muon neutrinos interact with neutron via the charge current interaction, you, uh, you have muons. And in this case, uh, muons uh, propagate uh, uh, you know, the long for the kilometer or you know, long distance. And in this case, uh, uh, we can actually they can be used to, uh, to uh, look for the position or the location of the sources uh, because this have a good uh, good for the uh, good pointing. And on the other hand, uh, when the electron neutrinos interact with uh, uh, matter uh, nuclear field charge current interactions, or in the case of the neutral current interactions, in, in this case we have a shower event, and in this case uh, uh, we have a good energy resolution. But instead, uh, because uh, uh, the photons and uh, scatters, and then the angle resolution is not so good. So the angle resolution typically order of 10, 10 to 15 degrees. So that we have a uh, kind of two detect main detection channels. And then this is a neutrino sky map. And then, so, the, so now that we see the uh, decent number of high energy neutrinos, and then, then this uh, dot is actually corresponds to the track events, uh, basically the uh, events caused by the muon neutrinos. And these are other ones actually the standing emitter, which is um, a combination of the shower events and tracks, uh, which occurred in the detector. And then you see that uh, roughly speaking, that we know that the distribution of the neutrinos is consistent with isotropic distribution. So, uh, this I suggest that uh, uh, the origin of the source of neutrinos are uh, uh, not dominated by galactic sources. And if the galactic, we expect that neutrinos are concentrated in the galactic frame, but which is not the case. So the, uh, the galactic sources are likely to be uh, uh, important uh, for the other sources of neutrinos. And we also have a, a spectrum. So this is a spectrum of neutrinos. And then you see the spectrum is actually the, uh, like this. And then you, we have a measurement so from the tracks and the showers. But the, roughly speaking, the spec, uh, energy, important information that the energy flux of neutrinos is about uh, several times 10 to the minus eight GeV per cent square per second per third. So the, this is actually the important number. And then uh, you see that the uh, different techniques actually lead uh, to shower measurements, the track measurements, uh, both lead to the similar tracks, very consistent. So we can also have uh, information on the flavors because uh, as I told you that uh, you have a tracks and the showers and the tracks are mostly uh, produced by the uh, muon neutrinos and the uh, uh, showers are produced by the electron neutrinos and the tau. So that by using the ratio of the shower to tracks that you can constrain the flavor ratio. And then uh, the present constraint is not super uh, strong. And then this is actually the, here is a 60 to 80% one sigma. 
and this is the two sigma region, and then this is the best fit. And then theoretically, the, uh, when the neutrinos are, uh, propagate in the intergalactic space, so we, we expect that the neutrino oscillation happens. Then uh, typically, that we expect the flavor ratio is order one to one to one. This means that uh, in the this flavor triangle plot, the, if one to one to one corresponds to the this center, okay, around the center. And then so far, the observations are consistent with the astrophysical expectation, but uh, you know, the, but other possibilities are still a lot. So uh, these are kind of the recent uh, status. And then last two years, another uh, uh, ingrained, another news. And then the ice cube is actually also can be, ice cube can be also be used to detect the anti neutrinos. When the anti electron neutrinos interact with electrons, and the W boson can be created. And this can be uh, called, uh, this, is a, this event is so called the Gratial resonance event, which was predicted in 1950. Nine and now the uh, ice cube discovered the one candidate event, and uh, uh, which is consistent with the Gratial resonance event that this is actually shown here. Then this was actually published in the last year as the Nature. Okay, so that this is the observation status, but now the actually uh, let's think about the where the neutrinos mainly come from. So what are the sources? The people. Be, we believe that neutrinos are, are produced by the cosmic accelerators and then like a monster, cosmic monsters, and then like a black hole jet, so as, we, as I mentioned. Then, of course, the ice cube people that try to ice cube collaboration try to look for the uh, neutrino sources. And then this is the latest uh, results of the point source searches. And then this is a, a a bit busy plot, and then the basic x axis is a declination. So the, here, the, this part is corresponds to the northern sky, and the, this part is corresponds to the southern sky. And the, peop, uh, the ice cube actually look for the neutrino events, the uh, excess events, uh, which are not consistent with the uh, uh, background. And then indeed, uh, uh, they start to see the, some hints. So the highest. Uh, Excess, largest excess is found to be the found to be the coincident co coincident with the AGN, which is a so MC1068, which is a uh, active galaxies. And the second uh, uh, most second most significant source is a TX0506, which is also the jet, AGN with jet. And then the other basically the significance is order of three sigma. And in a sense, uh, I, I would say this is catches, and then it's not the, it reached the discovery level. But uh, these are actually the, uh, these are very interesting, intriguing hints or the sources. Okay, so now there are, let's move on on the implications. So the I, this is an observation status. And then what is a, a theoretically is a how the neutrinos are produced. So uh, there are two uh, uh, main channels for the neutrino production. One is a uh, uh, p-gamma interaction, the other is the uh, pp interactions. So p-gamma interactions, basically the, when the protons very high energy cosmic rays uh, uh, exist, and then ultra high energy cosmic rays, very high energy cosmic rays interact with a photon and then create the pion. Then in this case, uh, uh, the interact uh, reactions uh, mainly uh, dominated by the resonance in the many astrophysical environments. This is important for the very luminous sources, such as the active galaxies or gamma ray bursts. The gamma ray bursts are the, uh, what the most, uh, the brightest explosion phenomena in the universe. And the other possibility is the cosmic reservoirs. And then the, in this case, uh, for example, if you think of the galaxies, and then galaxies actually, the, we have a cosmic rays. And then the cosmic rays, uh, uh, when the cosmic rays are propagated in the Milky Way or other galaxies, and they hit the gas. And then the, in this case, the PP interactions, actually, the, in this case, energy dependence is very weak. So in any case, uh, neutrinos can be produced uh, uh, the, by the pion decay, the charge of pion decay with the neutrinos. This is actually the main uh, neutrino, uh, the channel for neutrino production. But in, in either case, PP interaction or PP gamma interactions, 
not only charged pions, but also neutron pions should be produced. In a sense, in this setup, it, uh, we cannot avoid the production of gamma rays. And then gamma rays, and then the fate of gamma rays are different because as I told you, the very high energy gamma rays cannot be charged because they start to interact with the cosmic background radiation and making electron positron pairs. And then the story is actually a bit more complicated because they are not simply attenuated because they're very high energy electron positron pairs still the, uh, scatter, the comp still scatter the uh, photons by compton scattering, up scattering. And they still create gamma rays. And then eventually the gamma rays are cascaded down to low energies. And then this can be in principle observed. So we need to uh, take into account that this uh, physics process. So in the sense, now that actually the, uh, we can understand the importance of multi method approach. Yes, neutrinos are important because they're neutral, they can directly reach the Earth. But we, we should not discuss the other information because gamma rays actually, yeah, uh, maybe the attenuated, but eventually cascaded down. The eventually the low energy gamma rays should, uh, can reach the Earth. And the cosmic rays, yes, the, they may be diffracted, but you still have a data, right? We still have a data. The combining the uh, three messengers are uh, now the very important. They are uh, complementary. This is a multi-messenger approach. And it, indeed, uh, uh, one of the important uh, uh, fact we, uh, based on the ice cube discovery, is uh, this plot. Okay, so the EFI plots the uh, particle energy in the X axis. The y axis is the old sky flux. The neutrino data here and the gamma ray, uh, old sky flux is here. Then this is the ultra high the cosmic ray. And uh, you can see that the uh, energy of particle is actually the spans over the wide energy range, right? So the uh, gamma ray energy is actually the order of GeV, right? So the uh, 100 GeV to TeV. And then here is the energy of the cosmic ray around 10 to 20 electron volts. The particle energy is actually distributed over the 10 to over the magnitude in energy. But the old sky flux, energy flux is comparable. Okay, similar within the one, one of the magnitude, comparable. So that this implies that the energy generation rate per volume of the each particle, uh, each messenger is uh, comparable. So the basic energy budget of neutrinos, high energy gamma rays, and ultra high energy gamma rays are all comparable. Although the particle energy is very different. This is actually the very uh, suggestive, right? And then you, you, then you might think about the possible connections among the different messengers. So, okay, then this also, uh, this actually the, also the then question is that what is the sources then maybe you can start to look uh, for the other messenger. For example, the, yeah, we don't know the origin of neutrinos, but um, how about the gamma rays? The gamma rays actually, the, uh, actually the, can be measured and, uh, in, in detail. And indeed, actually, the, if you look at the extragetic gamma ray sky, and uh, we know that the uh, extragetic gamma ray sky, especially around the uh, 100 GeV range, and we know that uh, uh, sub, -TEB, sub TEB gamma ray background is dominated by the AGN, active galaxy nuclei with jets. So the, they are actually the powered by the black holes and the with jets. The, I already showed the picture of the MT7, right? The AGN picture, AGN. So that if you observe a jet from the, on Argus from here, so the, in the, then you can see the, uh, the Doppler boosted emission, which can be observed as a phaser. So this is a jet data. So the, uh, the observationary, the, we already detected the many, many, the, about several thousands of the brazers, jet data And then, then these brazers uh, can, uh, are responsible for the large fraction of the extracted camera background. So this, then this means that, okay, so you can think, right? So the, maybe the neutrinos, may also be explained by the razors, right? Because the gamma ray background, neutron background is comparable. The razor is actually responsible for the gamma ray sky. But answer is no, likely to be no. And then because the uh, important thing is that the gamma ray, brazers actually got at least uh, gamma ray, powerful brazers in the in gamma ray sky, 
a large result. And then you can do the uh, stacking analysis. And then people actually look for the uh, correlation between the, the braces and neutrinos. And then you can replace the limits. And the, the limits are here, okay? So the direct limits are here, only for the resolved sources. Of course, you have to think about the possible co contribution and resolved guys, but still, the, uh, it's unlikely to that the brazers are responsible for the 100% fraction of the all sky neutrino frax. So uh, the, we can also do the uh, all kind of anisotropy, the autocorrelation analysis, and then this also uh, analysis also leads to the complementary and similar conclusion. So most likely the brazers can make a uh, up to 30% contribution of the all the all sky neutrino in flux. And you have to come up with uh, other population, this in flux. So, okay, so the other tour use the gamma ray brights, uh, this brazer type agent, uh, difficult to explain the 100% of the all sky neutrino flux. And it's due to the similar reason, the gamma ray bursts are also difficult because gamma ray bursts are a very bright object and then you can observe and you can do the stacking. And then, then, then the, basically we, uh, we, we know that the contribution of the gamma ray burst is about few percent or less than few percent. So in this sense, actually now that it's kind of interesting to think about other possibilities such as cosmic reservoirs. And then the reservoir means that, uh, that basically that we can think about the objects such as galaxies or galaxy clusters. In this case, actually, the interesting uh, thing is that the people actually calculate the uh, neutrino flux of the galaxy clusters or starburst galaxies. And then actually, the, uh, this is actually the uh, theory papers that are written in the before the discovery of ice cream neutrinos. And then actually, the flux level is consistent with uh, what I can see. So in this sense, uh, you know, the observation and the theory are uh, roughly speaking consistent. So the what is this? These models are uh, something like this. So the uh, first, uh, the, uh, let's think about the uh, uh, reservoir, for example, galaxy clusters. And the galaxy clusters actually have a, a mem member, uh, the galaxy has a member, so including AGN. Then the AGN is actually cosmic accelerators, produce cosmic rays, and the cosmic rays actually are confined because of magnetic fields in the reservoir environment. So why is the low energy cosmic rays that confined and then the diffuse in the this magnetized environment and then they can produce uh, uh, they can uh, cause a PP or pigment interaction that make a pion. The pion decay, you have neutrinos gamma rays, the neutrino gamma rays uh, you know, propagate and then reach on us. And the ultra high energy cosmic rays, uh, low energy cosmic rays can be confined, but the ultra high energy cosmic rays are more difficult to confine. And then they can escape and then they can propagate if they eventually reach us after the directions. This is the kind of the idea of the reserve model. The reason why uh, this reserve uh, model is uh, appealing is that these scenarios uh, actually uh, uh, provide a possible solution to the grand unification scenario for the all three messengers. So the one of the interesting plots uh, that shows is that uh, the this plot, right? So the, the all three messengers have a similar flux and similar energy values. So that you might think about the possible connections. The answer, is it possible to make a, such a uh, unification scenario? The answer is yes. So these are the scenarios that provide the, actually the solution. So that for example, in this scenario, the confined cosmic rays will make a neutrinos and gamma rays, and then ultra high cosmic rays produced by the jet of the AGN that eventually escape and observe on the, uh, the can be observed on Earth. So that in the sense, and, uh, uh, it's possible uh, to achieve the grand unification, astroparticle grand unification using this uh, picture. This is appearing. So, so, so maybe that you may be happy at this point, right? Because it's possible to explain the three messengers simultaneously with a single population. But uh, okay, there. But now that I'm going to start to discuss a bit more complications. So actually, if you look at the uh, data of neutrinos, especially around here, the you you see the notice in excess, right? 
here. So the around the 10th or the dozen 10 TB is actually the salary uh, curve is actually the below the, this data. This is actually the, this result is actually the quite robust. So uh, we do that, we look for the, uh, this kind of uh, gamma ray neutrino connection in mobility. So the, the here is the, this is the data. So the shower data is here and this is truck data. Then as I told you, no matter what the details are, the, if the neutrinos are produced, gamma rays must be produced. And then neutrinos and the gamma rays eventually the cascaded down and then, then observed in the GEB, TV energy range. And then if you want to explain the neutrino data, then you can compute the corresponding gamma ray flux. And then it turns out the uh, gamma ray flux, corresponding gamma ray flux actually overshoots the uh, Fermi gamma ray background. So the, you see that, for example, if you look at dashed curve, and this shaded range is actually the allowed gamma ray background for the, this kind of contribution. So you see that this is actually strong tension. So this means that uh, if you assume that the gamma rays neutrinos are created a similar way and the gamma rays just escape, and you have a problem in the over, uh, actually the bio ratings uh, observed gamma ray background data, the Fermi data. So how you can solve this problem? So the, probably the simplest answer is to think about hidden source. Hidden means that maybe if you can, if you block gamma rays inside the sources, you can avoid this, right? Then you, somehow if you, if you prepare a shield and then the gamma rays block, then you can actually avoid this kind of the constraints. Then actually the, such a uh, scenario is actually the more and the more appealing recently. And then, then do you have a hint of the, such a uh, hidden source? The answer is also yes. I already showed the uh, results of the 10 year point source search and the highest significant source is NC 106 a This NC 106 a actually is a known to be an obscured AGN. So the AGN with a, a very dusty environment. And then, and then, then we actually, the ice cube data is actually here is a plot. And then this kind of theoretically is that it's possible to explain that this neutrino flux by if the cosmic rays are accelerated in the vicinity of the black holes, like a corona, so because of it, when the black hole is there, then the matter agrees uh, because of the angular momentum that we eventually it forms a disk. And we have a high temperature region, so-called the corona. And if the particles are accelerated in the, these regions, uh, you can uh, produce neutrinos. But in such a dense, in such a vicinity of black hole is also the uh, very dense and uh, opaque for the gamma rays. So the gamma rays actually cannot escape directly. And eventually that should be cascaded down to the lower energy, the inside sources. So in a sense, actually though, uh, NHC 1068 actually the, uh, can be uh, uh, explained by the, such a hidden source scenario. And also one of the interesting things that theoretically it predicts that this source is actually the, to be the brightest neutrino source in the northern sky and which is consistent with the observation. Okay, so the, this is a kind of the, uh, 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 recent status or the, uh, the, about the origin of the high energy nutrients. Then, of course, in order to establish the sources, we need more data. And we also need the, uh, uh, the next generation the gamma detectors. Uh, uh, but uh, what we can do now is uh, actually the interesting possibility is to look for trend. So, so the so far that we discussed uh, kind of steady emission, the persistent emission of the neutrino. The, but uh, if you have a, a information of the timing, right? So the, that's actually the very good. So the, the one of the uh, problem for the, one of the challenge for the neutrino detection is the background. So the background actually that uh, come from the atmospheric background, right? And then, then in order to reduce atmospheric backgrounds, that if you know the position and the timing, and then you can reduce the, uh, the effective reduce the background, and then which is good for the purpose of detecting neutrino sources. And also we have a strong motivations. So in the multi-messenger era, so the supernovae or gamma ray burst 
they are tran these are transients uh, caused by the uh, uh, caused by the cracks of the uh, massive stars, right? And then in addition to such a, a supernova, gamma ray burst, then the, we uh, the, in the in now the people are uh, more excited by the people are very excited uh, by the uh, neutron star mergers and the black hole mergers, which are known to be the source of the gravitation waves. And then we also have a, a Asia and active gamma black holes also show the flares. And then like a blazer flares, a tidal disruption event. So this is caused by the when the star is actually disrupted uh, by a supermassive black hole. So these are very interesting. There are many different kinds of the targets for the neutrinos and gamma rays and perhaps gravitational waves. And then recently the uh, uh, well, recently, actually, the people uh, we have an ongoing attempt over the looking for the multi-massive sources, and uh, we don't want to miss the neutrino gravitational wave events. Then people try to uh, develop a network, worldwide network, and and then to look for the uh, multi-massive sources for the real-time coincidence searches. Well, we can uh, we want to share the uh, data, and then the, if we can share the data promptly, the, which can be very useful for the follow-up observation. And then, just I want to advertise uh, our uh, one of the uh, uh, ongoing attempts uh, led by the Penn State University, uh, which is an astrophysical mass machine observer network, uh, which is the so-called AMO. So this idea is actually try to look for the uh, neutrino gravitational wave transients that using the subterrestrial data. And we actually that contributes the, uh, the, uh, the providing the errors of the neutrinos. And then the one of the actually the interesting, the, also the very important example is uh, uh, ice cube 70 or 922A, which is, uh, which is coincident with the uh, uh, blazer of TXS0506. I already showed this as a second highest significance event in the 10 point, year point source search. And this was actually the uh, uh, neutrinos that was detected. And then uh, actually this alert was sent via the AMO and GCN. And then uh, the uh, people look for the counterparts of the very this one high energy neutrino event with the energy of uh, about 200 TeV to 1 PeV. And they found the gamma ray counterpart. And they also found the X-ray counterpart, okay? Then you can compute the, uh, the significance and then the, uh, the coin significance of the coin of the coincidence is about three sigma, which is still the kind of not striking, but this is a very interesting because this is seen in the different wavelengths from radio, optical, and the gamma rays, and they sh you know, these blazers actually the, has a, a was a flaring up at the time of neutrino detection. And then they ask you people look for the, uh, this uh, neutrino data at this source. And there's another interesting uh, flare in the past data. Okay, this is different from the, uh, this flare. I give people to dig out the data, archival data of the neutrinos from uh, in this direction. And then this is a, a time where the 170922 where was detected. But uh, in the around 2014, 2015, uh, they found that certain events in neutrinos. And then this is actually correspond to the 3.5 sigma, uh, sigma level of the, but in, in this case, uh, we, they already found a neutrino flare and uh, they don't find a, a gamma ray flare or X-ray flare. So just, this is just neutrino flare. Okay, so, but this is actually, there are two, three sigma, 3.5 sigma, which are look appealing. And the question is that uh, how we can interpret this uh, theoretically. Then actually the situation is actually the very puzzling. So the, this actually also demonstrates the importance of the multi messenger approach. As I already stressed that the, if the neutrinos are produced, uh, not only neutrinos, but also gamma rays or electron positron power pairs should be generated. And then they are eventually, uh, they eventually cause the electromagnetic cascades uh, via the interaction with photons and synchrotron emission, the inverse Compton emission. Eventually, the day energy must appear in somewhere, especially in typically in the X ray to gamma ray range. For then, 
for example, in the case of 2017 flare, if you neutrino data is here, okay, if you want to explain the neutrino data or with this flux level, basically what is the corresponding gamma ray flux is violates the observed X ray flux. Because in this case, we have a very excellent uh, spectrum from the optical X ray gamma ray. So you see the peak. But the, the, if the neutrino flux is this level, basically the corresponding gamma ray flux actually the field of this deep and which violates the observation. And then neutrino flux has to be very low. This is uh, basically essentially uh, dri driven by energy conservation. Now it's very difficult to avoid. And then the situation is worse for the 2014 2015 prayer. And then because we have certain events, okay, that if you want to explain this neutron data, and again, you can compute the corresponding gamma ray flux, and then you see that you already apply overshoot the X-ray upper limits and the gamma ray limits. So basically, uh, we don't have a concordance picture of the, this uh, mass messenger data. And then at least uh, if this observation is the case, standard single zone model is uh, actually fake. So it's puzzling that this implies that we probably need to find more sources, right? Because it's just one source may not be convincing. And then the question is that, uh, do we, did we detect the more coincidence in the more follow-up observations? The actually the answer is still yes. So the, there are a couple of the interesting events, actually the, uh, the, the two more coincidence plus basically we have four. And then in particular, the two of them actually kind of interesting. So the, uh, for example, the, this ISTB 901001A and the 2005330A. So they're basically the day these neutrino events uh, turned out, out to be coincident with uh, uh, some optical transient, okay? So the optical AT is actually the, the optical transient, okay? So the, they are bright optical transient and uh, with strong radio emissions. So the significance is again, the, actually the order of the exceeds as order of three sigma level or even more. So, the, so in this sense, we start to have more coincidence and then the, what they are. So the, we also have a neutral event which coincides with the optical transient and actually the these 8219 DSG and 8290 FDR uh, in, typically interpreted as a tidal disruption event. Tidal disruption events uh, uh, the happened when the uh, star is captured by the supermassive black hole and the, about the half of the star is actually toned and then the ejected. The other half is actually the accretes on the supermassive black hole. Eventually we have a uh, disk, jets and wind. And then, then such an event start to be observed and it's observed that such as TDs have been observed in the different wavelengths. And then maybe the, this, this observation might suggest that the TDs, uh, tidal disruption events and the AGN, neutrino emissions may have a uh, share the similar mechanism because the uh, structure is actually, the, the physics actually, the, they both have uh, this kind of corona and then the winds and jets. But uh, probably in order to establish the, this uh, picture, right? So the, whether neutrinos uh, come from the black hole, black hole flares, uh, sources of neutrinos or not, we definitely need more data and stay tuned. Okay, so uh, it's a, I think that I already uh, talked about uh, 45 minutes. And then uh, what is, how do you proceed? Uh, should you, I finish? Or I can briefly mention, the, talk about the new physical implication. You can take another maybe 10 minutes or so. Okay, good. Okay, just I okay, so I so far I talked about the uh, uh, astrophysical implications. So, the so the, uh, I talk about the origin of the uh, can can it source with the high neutrinos and also talk about the neutrino transient. And then, second important direction is to use the neutrinos to probe the uh, new physics, uh, the physics beyond the standard model. And then, then this is a, uh, of course, uh, um, there are deep, many possibilities. I cannot, I cannot cover everything. And then, uh, for example, the uh, people can try to uh, uh, use the neutrinos 
to look for the heavy dark matter and using spectral information or arrival directions well, by using the neutrinos, uh, by looking for the neutrino data, that you, you can try to look for the uh, possible uh, non-standard interactions uh, between um, uh, involved by neutrinos or search for the neutrino decay. So in particular, in order to stress the power of the match messenger uh, approach, I, I just hope uh, briefly discuss the dark matter case. Now, actually, the story of the power of the March messenger is a, a kind of picture of the March messenger approach is similar. In the case of dark matter, okay, we consider the astrophysical sources as a source of neutrinos, gamma rays, cosmic rays. But instead of the astrophysical uh, cosmic ray acceleration, then you can think about the dark matter decay or annihilation. So if the dark matter is a self annihilate, or if just dark matter decay, and then if the decay products or nuclear products are standard model particles, and you have gamma rays, neutrinos, and the cosmic rays, and then we can use them as a messenger. This is actually the mass messenger approach. And then this is actually the one of the, uh, the people already discussed that dark matter, decaying dark matter, as a possible uh, source of the ice cream neutrinos. For example, this is a bit old approach, but uh, people will try to explain the actually the uh, ice cube data using the uh, dark matter decay. But uh, in general, so the, if the dark matter is actually the, uh, in general, the, if the, again, the same problem, that if you have neutrinos, uh, then you should expect some gamma rays. For example, the, uh, this actually it depend on the final states of the particles, a particle decay or annihilation. But uh, for example, in the case of the uh, BB bar, the neutrinos, gamma rays, as comparable flux of neutrinos, gamma rays are produced. And then uh, they, the, there's an important difference in the case of the dark matter decay, because uh, in the case of dark matter decay, uh, we, the, there's, there's, there's a, uh, we have a galactic dark matter component that, as well as the X-ray gamma, gamma, uh, dark matter component. Galactic dark, dark matter component is, is a, uh, very important, uh, gives an important uh, contribution. And then actually that this gives a uh, significant flux even above the TV energies. But you can see that you already start to see the tension with the Fermi gamma ray background, also the air shower uh, cosmic ray experiment data around the PV branch. So uh, this brought actually the, uh, the Presents a uh, complementary of the three messengers. Okay, so I already discussed that uh, uh, that attention the, in the, the it's a not so it's not so easy to explain the uh, ten to one hundred TV neutrino data. And then if you want to this, explain this data with BB bar, that, that this is the best parameter space. But this model is again that predicts a huge significant flux of the gamma rays. And these are gamma ray constraints on the uh, lifetime of the dark matter. And you see the strong tension, uh, not sorry, you the kind of tension um, between the gamma ray constraints and this parameter space. So, uh, so this actually demonstrates the importance of the multi messenger approach. Basically, the gamma ray experiments, neutron experiments, and also the ultra, so cosmic ray experiments, air shower experiments, actually, the uh, all complementary that gives a more or less comparable constraints on the heavy dark matter. So the, uh, in this sense, actually, that you want to test the heavy dark matter, and then the, it's very important to look for the, uh, the not only gamma rays and neutrinos, and but also the co cosmic ray experiments. Okay, so the, this is the summary. So the, the probably one of the uh, most important message of the uh, current uh, neutrino observation is that the, the neutrino energy budget, cosmic ray energy budget, gamma ray energy budget, roughly compatible. So this might indicate the connection, physical connection among the three messengers. So the, where the neutrinos may come from? So we don't know, but the brazers and the gamma ray bursts, they are likely this subdominant. And then because of this, uh, com uh, com because of this uh, fact, the grand unification picture is uh, kind of appearing. But on the other hand, the uh, uh, story may be a bit more complicated because the detailed comparisons between neutrino and gamma data start to indicate the hidden sources. Indeed, uh, such hidden sources are also indicated by the 
uh, NG1068, uh, uh, which is actually the popped up the uh, highest significant source in the STV neutrino point search. Neutrino surrounds are very interesting, so that we have unique chances. And then, but in order to see, find, discover the surrounds, we need a strategic multi messenger search. And people are working on the, uh, you know, this topic uh, in the worldwide. And then, then we start to find uh, the intriguing coincidence with the black hole players, but we lack the concordance picture. In order to establish the uh, mass messenger picture, well, we need the more data, the station. And so the, the ice cube neutrinos are also uh, important to test for the testing the new physics. And I just discussed uh, dark matter as an example. So and then the mass messenger approaches are also important and uh, for the uh, this kind of uh, uh, testing the heavy dark matter models. So the future is bright so because uh, the, we have ice cube, but uh, uh, we are the, now the, in the military sea, the chemistry net is uh, there. And in, uh, the, also the Baikal GB is actually the, uh, uh, is in the, uh, we have uh, two neutrino detectors in the Northern sky. And then in more distant future, so you know, people actually want to have a ice cube gen to the distant next generation neutron detectors, which are about the 10 kilometer cubic volume. And then not only that these detectors, we were going to have a uh, ultra high neutron detector relying on the searching the air showers uh, in the, looking for the radio signatures or optical signatures. So there are basically the many ideas or the many proposals for the detecting the ultra high uh, cosmic particles that are being proposed. So that we, we are going to, we, I'm pretty sure that we will have more multi messenger data in the next decade, which will, will enable us to test the proposal models. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Koda, for the very nice talk. Um, let's see if there are any questions. Um, Jim? Yeah, um, thinking back to the days when we were like proposing experiments like Veritas and Ice Cube, I remember having this rule of thumb that, you know, for every pi naught or, you know, pi pluses and pi, mi pi minuses, and you have one gamma ray for every, um, you know, uh, for every kind of neutrino from uh, if the source isn't obscured. And I remember finding out that the effective area of ice cube was something like a few meters squared uh, when you take into account the cross section, whereas, you know, a ground-based gamma ray telescope has 10 to the five or 10 to the six meters squared. Um, so I never really expected ice cube to see um, things, even things like Mercurian 501, even the very bright uh, sources. So it really feels like obscured sources of the story. But I also kind of felt like Ice Cube should see the galactic center <laughs> uh, before anything else, because that that really is a bright uh, gamma ray source. And and well, I know I know that the TV gamma rays are absorbed after a redshift of about 0.1 or 0.2, but there are some of these characteristic sources within that redshift. And um, so, on the one hand, it's really mysterious to me where these things. Are coming from because you definitely don't see the gal galactic plane. Yeah. It must be obscured sources somehow. Yeah. And and then I just had a thought that obscured sources, if your model is correct for like obscured sources like AGNs, if you have a really high accretion, phot a lot of accretion photons that are absorbing the gamma rays, you will also actually get a very high inverse Compton peak in lower energy. Uh, hard x-rays, gamma rays. So that might be the more relevant component for a multi-messenger correlation uh, would be the, if they're absorbed sources that are time variable, then maybe your best bet is a very high uh, inverse Compton power at lower energy. So maybe, maybe really the TEV sources are exactly the wrong thing to look at. <laughs> that was a complicated argument, but maybe you see what I'm saying. Okay, so the, okay, so the, okay, Derek, you, you made three points. Okay, so the, let's begin with the third point, rest point. 
So that I agree with you. So that indeed, actually, the yes, as you pointed out, the event eventually the energy must appear in some burn. In the case of the AGN, in the obscured AGN, if the, uh, the neutrinos are produced in the vicinity of the supermassive black hole, that they should appear in the MEB range. The process actually depends on the magnitude, which we don't know. But uh, whether the synchrotron emissions, the inverse compound emission dominate in either case, uh, they should appear in the MEB range. Oh, boy. This is the MEB. And then, then this is uh, actually that this actually uh, is very important to look for the MEB gamma ray parent. And uh, the Amigo X or E astrogram that these. That's are right. That's right. That's yeah, what I'm really thinking. Yeah, yeah. These are very. This is actually the, this is the prediction because this is energy right. conservation. And this right. actually uh, provides a, one of the uh, important tests mm -hmm. for this kind of picture. Then I completely agree with you. And then in this case. And then, okay, so the, for the galactic case, uh, first of all, the ice cube is not good for the galactic center because uh, it's, you know, uh, they, they can still look for the neutrinos from the southern sky. But uh, uh, because in that case, uh, you suffer from the backgrounds and uh, because the ice cube oh. is like at the northern sky. Right. Um, so uh, so the, there are the contained downward going events and then there are the yeah. upward going. Yeah, but you still do, you still would do better with like Antares or some or I don't know some northern what is it now uh, the chemistry yeah, net, like, some uh, some northern hemisphere would be better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but but I agree that probably uh, now that I still observe the you know the more than ten years and the center is probably difficult. That uh, it's not surprising that. Uh, I still start to see some hints in, from, the, from the signals in the galactic prime that because uh, one of the in, in, interesting news is uh, in the last year was the discovery of the diffuse high energy gamma rays reported by Tibet uh, air shower gamma ray experiments. So the, the, they found the galactic uh, diffuse gamma rays in the 100 TB range. The, if this scenario, is, uh, if this is a really hot ironic, so actually the ice cube sensitivity to the galactic prime is not far. So in the, yeah, so the, right. actually okay. the center might be difficult, but it's not, but mm -hmm. important thing is that, yeah, even if this is the case, even if the ice cube mm -hmm. starts to see the signal from the galactic brain, the contribution to the old sky neutrino flux is still subnormal, the order of 10% or something like that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the, those are very good answers, thanks. MBJ, you had a question? Oh, it's muted. You are muted. <laughs> yeah, it's just a futuristic question. You're talking about different kind of messengers. Maybe a few years from now, shall we have gravitational waves also as messengers? Including oh, yeah. in this part? Oh, yes. Thank you very much for the, uh, the point uh, bringing this topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gravitational waves actually is already, we start to see the, uh, Okay, we already detected uh, uh, gravitational waves from the neutron star mergers and uh, the black hole mergers. And then so far that we have not succeeded in the detecting the coincident <laughs> detection of neutrinos and gravitational waves. But uh, in principle, uh, uh, these kinds of merger events actually are also the interesting targets for the uh, neutrinos. So the, that we actually studied for the neutrino emission from the neutron star mergers, black hole mergers, and including the supermassive black hole mergers. And then the, in principle, the we may be able to detect the neutrino signals which are coincident with the gravitational waves. However, the, I think that uh, uh, this, this might be, this will be difficult with the present ice scale. Probably we need the next generation detector such as ice cube events. But uh, this is actually theoretically the, uh, for example, the if the, when the, the neutron star merger happened, we have jets and the neutrons can be produced by jets. And then, then in a sense, it's kind of possible to expect that some uh, neutron gravitational waves together with the electromagnetic signals. So the answer is yes, but uh, probably not in the, uh, now, so probably we need to wait for the next generation detectors, in my opinion. Thanks. Any other questions?
So about this dark matter interpretation that you had, uh, um, I, I remember that in the old ice cube data, they had some small excess around 100 TV range, and that motivated people to try to have this decay of the dark matter fitting that particular excess. But do you know if what's the current status of that? Uh, is the new in the new ice cube data? I don't think the excess is still there. But maybe you have a better idea. Okay. The... Probably the latest data. Oh, oops. Okay, here is a uh, this one. So the uh, U means uh, X. We have a kind of if you look at the shower data, we still have a kind of the deep region. Deep, <laughs> it's a kind of deep region. But for example, the, if you look at the latest uh, shower data, uh, the truck data. Sorry, this is truck data which uh, published in last year and, and actually appeared in the archive last year. Actually, the, I don't see the significant excess in the, this 100 TV range. But uh, I still think that, uh, uh, you know, in, in this sense, actually, so far, the shower data and the truck data are consistent with each other. There's no hint for the excess or deep and so on. But uh, possibly, may, we may have a cutoff, but uh, still, uh, it's not super significant. But I, I st do think that uh, 100 TV range, you know, I don't uh, still the 10 TB flux that I told you, the 10 TB flux is still high compared to the, this range. So in a sense, actually, well, you already discussed, uh, I think that you are one of the papers, you discussed a possible two component um, models. And then, well, whether dark matter component is that, you know, uh, is we there or not, even for the astrophysical components, actually, the, it's very important to check whether the single component is sufficient or not. Actually, the, because this flux is too high, and uh, so it's a big question, right? So the, this sort of component is actually requires some hidden sources. Probably, we probably need something, and uh, maybe this component, highest energy components, and this component might actually the, have a different sources, for example. This is a totally possible. And in, in a sense, actually, uh, it's not significant, but uh, uh, I think this is some a possibility we should consider in more detail with the next upcoming data or using the future data. But actually, it's an important thing. Okay, um, thanks. Let's see if there are any more questions. I don't see any at the moment. Um, so, if not, let's thank uh, Kota again for the very nice talk. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.